all of you in this room, one at a time. I must remind you that the uh, scanning experience is usually a painful one, sometimes resulting in nosebleeds, earaches, stomach cramps, nausea, sometimes other symptoms of a similar nature. There's a doctor present, Dr. Gatineau. I know that you've all been prepared for this, but I thought I'd just remind you just the same. Uh, there is one other thing. No one is to leave this room once the demonstration has begun. At this point, I'd like to call for volunteers. I 
want you to make a link from your brain to his heart.
<laughs> hey, we're uh, we're live. It's ten. Good morning. A good looking group. We've already been deep in conversation. I'm Scott Stimson with International Computer Solutions, and we are the San Carlos Computer Club. Thank you guys for showing up this morning. As you can see, I am still in my office. I was explaining earlier that it's just become too difficult sharing a vehicle to get things done. And I have not gotten over to tequilas to test anything. And it occurs, I can't have the car this morning because <laughs> Yuya is in charge of taking the kids to school and she combines that with work and Wyma she has to do so that I can do this meeting in the morning. So I think I'm here until we, we get ourselves a second car which uh, hopefully uh, we're on a path to doing. We're gonna go do some test drives of vehicles in Hermosillo this next week, we hope, and uh, try and pick out some reasonably priced new car. But until then, we'll continue to have virtual meetings and I will continue to, um, to plan for the next Tuesday, hopefully doing it in person, but even that will be a virtual meeting. How's everybody doing this morning? Everybody give away. They're all healthy. I see good, happy faces. Has anybody brought any topics today? I will stick a link in our, of our document into today's chat. In case you have not had a chance to bring it up, you can click on this. And I've stuck a few news articles in there, as well as a couple of personal experiences I've recently had that I thought you might find interesting. I have a need. Let's hear your need, Cheryl. Um, I need to make a spreadsheet on my iPad or on my iPhone, something in, in that realm. Um, Bill uses Google Sheets. I've still got that stupid problem with my Google Docs, my Google Sheets. Everything is telling me I'm out of storage and that, that I don't have any room for anything. So I can't use Sheets. I'm wondering if anybody has a recommendation for what they use. You guys, don't you, I, I thought you guys even paid for some Google storage or is that just iCloud you're paying no, for? No, we've got iCloud. iCloud, okay. So I want something that, yeah. Because since you have iCloud, you could kind of, you could empty your Google Sheets, couldn't you? I mean, your Google Docs, if you wanted to use Google Sheets, the, uh, that would... I can't even figure out what it is that is in my Google that is using up all my space. Like, I think there's Google Photos, Google Dots, Sheets, Notes, like Mail. You know, this this might actually be the topic that you're interested in bringing. I've de I've been dealing with this recently myself because I'm running out of space. Uh, I uh, don't want to buy space from Google. I don't want to buy space from any of them just because I'm cheap. I think if I did buy buy space, it would probably be with Microsoft because it's a ridiculous amount of space at a very reasonable price. But I keep finding ways to get around getting into, into space. Um, like, like, for example, Amazon, using Amazon for photos. I, I feel very comfortable now eliminating photos that I have stored in my Google space because I know I have them stored in my Amazon space. Chris, and until, you know, okay, I'm sorry, Chester, did you have a question? You know the problems I've had with my, Microsoft's OneDrive. Um, I wouldn't recommend Microsoft. Yeah, Chester, I, I'm familiar with, with your frustrations with it, and I've just had great experiences with it. So, I mean, to each his own, <laughs> but but I do think that there are ways you can screw up with any one of these. I think that they can screw up for you. It's You're definitely taking your assets and putting them out there on somebody else's service. And so there's there's that relationship, the instructions and the changes. That, I mean, all G Google has to do is change something like, say, all accounts are going to be 10 gigabytes instead of 15 gigabytes. And uh, you'd find a lot more people like Cheryl going, I'm running out of space real quick, just overnight. And that's the problem with using these third-party services is that you're not certain exactly where where it begins and ends being being for you and being for them. That being said, uh, I like 
I like having things set up so that there are backups happening in the cloud. I, especially the Google thing has always been really easy for me for photos. Yeah, you just turn it on and it's synchronizing photos in the background. It's got a bunch of photo tools that it's offering to you. Uh, things like face matching and special effects. And Google does a lot of stuff in photos like building collages, um, doing special effects. And then it kind of hands you these things and says, hey, do you like that? Do you want to save it? You want to throw it away? It's just something I tried. That's, that's how Google Photos works. That's not necessarily the point I was making in this case because I found myself running out of Google Space recently. I'm I'm at like 93% occupied. And so so if that was Cheryl's topic, that's something that I am dealing with right now. What is the best way to not have to buy into Google Space and use what I've already got available to me? And that's why I brought up uh, the Amazon Photos thing is that I feel very comfortable removing the photo backups that I have in Google Photos because I know I have stuck all of that in Amazon Photos. I also know for per, uh, perpetual um, storage, I should be able to use Amazon. As long as they don't change anything, I can rely on that being my photo store when I'm thinking of these these backups. Now, there's there's some stuff you you give up when you decide to give up on Google Photos. You give up on all those bells and whistles I was just mentioning. You... But in Amazon Photos, there are two things. Um, they have some bells and whistles too. They make movies and do different things for you and you can do editing. In but, an Amazon um, sort of way, not quite as good. Not included. Well, not, not for free. Yeah. And so there's... Go yeah. ahead, Cheryl. I'm sorry. You, you Amazon Prime gets you unlimited photos, but not unlimited video. Yeah. Yeah. And so this is I like I've gone through and I've been cleaning up my my Google photos. I've been making I've been making decisions on what I can live without having available to Google photos. And unfortunately, I, I don't think I'm making the best decisions like I've deleted a bunch of videos which I know specifically are not in Amazon Photos, but I needed some space very quickly. And so what I did is I downloaded those videos. I, I, I know I've got the videos here on my backups and on, but I still took a moment and downloaded those videos to my hard drive, to my SSD drive of the laptop, because I have the space. I went ahead and just, before I deleted them, because I needed to free up some space very quickly. So I'm, I'm struggling with, with the best way, the be, the easiest way to deal with this is just to start paying for space. The easiest thing to do is, and that's the reason, that's the reason it bumps you right into buying subscription services. Get, manage your space is a euthanism in Google for come buy, purchase space from us. When you, when you follow the manage your space, it, it, there's no tools there to help you sort out what you should get rid of. Or it just, it, it, it's a menu of how much space you can buy years ago when we had limited hard drive space I had uh, probably 50 years of photos that I had digitized and put into my computer and I was very concerned that I was using up too much capacity so I took all of these photos and I reduced the pixels big mistake yeah absolutely oh, big, big mistake. oh. yeah yeah, but you know, we used to think like that. Now it's very easy to get a lot more space. But back then we were it was very expensive to get more space. So when you were running out of it, you were looking for creative ways to to take advantage of that space. Well, anyway, Cheryl, that's I mean, maybe that's that's what because Sheets is a good option for you. The the other another good option is Microsoft Excel because there's a free tier of that for everyone that has an Outlook account. And there is a web interface to Excel that handles most of the basic spreadsheet needs. But the free Microsoft Excel in an Apple on an iPad or an iPhone, is that possible? Yeah, yeah, I believe so. In fact, let me look at this iPhone here. Did I even install it? 
Uh, I've got Word installed. I don't have Excel installed. But it seems like they're available for free. You know, they're the they're the bring you in. They the, what the difference between where we were in the past and where we are now is that that they're more like drug dealers now. They want to give you a little taste of it and have you keep coming back. But what they don't want is they don't want you to stop using their formats or their services. And so I believe that the basic web app, uh, which is what you get on the mobile, is free. Um, and I'm just going to do a quick search here from Microsoft. Now, the, the only disadvantage of that is most people don't think of themselves as having uh, a free version of Excel. Yeah, I see there's a free version of Excel right here. Dare I download it while we're doing all this? Let's see what happens. But so the, this is a this is a um, a um, a compacted version of those like standard uh, Excel uh, functions that you would want if all of a sudden you had to open an Excel document and you didn't uh, have Excel and you didn't want to buy it and it allows you to do some some. Well, I, I want to use the word rudimentary editing, but actually it's it's pretty sophisticated to not having Excel, the the editing you can do. You can't you, you don't normally think of these apps as giving you access to like cross sheet imports and tabulation, but you do think of them as allowing you to have access to multi sheets in one workbook and doing calculations, sums and averages and, and, and those things of that nature. And so it may be the free tier is enough to get get away with it. I use Open Office. Yes, Open Office is is I use uh, I I don't use Open Office. I use LibreOffice, which is a fork of Open Office, which is fine. the The only friction with that is you got to get whoever's going to do it to open it up, and it's not available on mobile either, and so. The, that's one of the real advantages of Google. I mean, and now Microsoft, the problem with Microsoft is people just don't think of doing it that way. They, they think you got to download this Excel spreadsheet, find a copy of Excel, run it on a computer that supports Excel. But this new Microsoft stuff is available to you in anything that has a web browser. And so you can maintain the document in the cloud with OneDrive. That can be shared amongst your friends that have OneDrive. It can be shared amongst your friends that don't have one OneDrive if they just want to be able to view it. And they're able to use Excel in a web browser to get access to it. And people just don't think of Excel as functioning like that. And that's where Google Sheets has a much better standing. If you just accept that it's Google Sheets and you need a Google account, Everybody's on board and everything works. It's never worked in any other way. It's always been in the cloud. It's always been stored there. The app is always driven from there. And so anything is able to open that document that has a web that has a web browser. And so I always I, just, I think I think Google Sheets, Google is just ends up being my default for that reason. Go ahead, Cheryl. I just was in the app store and I found the open or Libra ones, but I spreadsheet trademark office sheets, spreadsheet with Excel formula. I spreadsheet. Anybody tried it? Well, no, I'm not familiar with it, but why wouldn't you just use Excel? Well, it says 4.5. I searched for free. It says it's free, simple, and to use, yet powerful. Hmm. It's an iOS. What did you call it? I spreadsheet? Yeah, the letter I spreadsheet, office sheets. Okay. I spreadsheet. Gets 4.5 out of 5 stars. Huh. Maybe this brings you the um, kind of capabilities of complex sheets like I was talking about the distinguish yeah. between the two. You know, that's another thing that I like about Google Sheets with my recent development for this or organization in Arizona is uh, that you can do very complex spreadsheets in Google Sheets. You don't have to, oh, now, now I need to purchase a version that will let me do that. 
whereas Excel, you can do that. You can have a sheet where it's it's like all these all these extras are cut off from you because you don't have the full blown version. You're using the web version, and that just doesn't happen with Google Sheets. So the developer is Savvy Soda, and there are 811 ratings. So I suppose when I'm looking at an app rating, I should you know check those kind of things out. The developer, the yeah, it gets 4.5 out of five, but only 811 people have. Right. Don't don't take for granted that they might have 800 people working on it. Yeah. <laughs> it's. That's definitely the case in places like Microsoft and Google. It's like, oh, those could all just be developer reviews. <laughs> well, I don't know if that helps answer your question, but I think, I mean, if you're looking for an answer of how to do a spreadsheet, I think I would sort out your Google space because that's a, that's a just, that's a problem. But I would, even if you have to make a new Google account to have space, and, and well, that's... I, wonder, I wonder if that was one of the things I must have tried because I saw something the other day and it said share how 57 at, at uh, Gmail. And I thought I don't ever remember creating anything like that. And maybe that's what they're telling me is full of storage stuff. And uh, yeah, so but the whole thing with the Google space has been a level of frustration mm -hmm. for over two years now. <laughs> so. <laughs> Well, all I can say is that's that's how they all do it. That's how Microsoft does it with OneDrive. That's how how Apple Apple does it all the time with, with iCloud. Is they allow it to be a frustration that's easily resolved with a credit card. <laughs> that's how it works. Yeah. But but I think that getting another Google account simply because you need space is a very reasonable way to deal with it there's nothing that says you can't have more than one google account and and all you do is you just share a folder with your main account that 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 is in that other account and then everything that's created in that folder is stored in that other account if that makes sense and you can also if you decide to do that and actually i mean i'm sounding very nonchalant like i've done it like i haven't particularly done it that way but what i have done is i've got my google drive now installed where in this computer i think oh i hate to mess with it right now but i've got a google drive for an account i use for work and an account I would use for myself installed in my in my Windows platform and it's available for Macintosh now. I thought that they had discontinued it, but apparently they brought it back where you can map a drive locally to a, a space out there, a Google space out there under a particular account. And because I've already done that, I know that it's possible to have more than one account mapped as a drive in your computer which means that you could use your computer as a go-between to move files from one drive to the other drive. So if you needed access to either of those drives, you could have them locally in your computer so that you, you wouldn't have to worry about that being, being space out there that's unmanaged. You could manage it right from your computer. Whereas you don't have to take advantage of the email, the YouTube account, or any of the other stuff that comes along with the Google account. You could just use it for another drive of 15 gigabytes. I don't know what I've done on my end, but you guys, everything sounds so crisp and clear when, when you're speaking that when you're not, I, I feel like I've lost connection. <laughs> I heard you laugh, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> I got a question for you. Please, Jim, go ahead. My Express VPN on the PC seems to be broken. Yeah. Other than uh, 
Um, or the first question is, have you checked to see if there's an update? Because it actually writes that in a bar above the software on your computer. No, and I have not. If you if you open no, up the I the yeah and and you might it might be right there in front of you and you're not even looking at it because we've all been trained to ignore anything that looks like an ad <laughs> yeah okay let's see because expressvpn periodically updates and occasionally uh it doesn't get updated on your system like your system will continue to work even though it didn't get an update i believe it's supposed to update itself automatically given the right right circumstances but i run into it often enough where it hasn't been updated that that's typically the problem when when you go from not being able to connect or go from being able to connect one day to not being able to connect the next and it's just stopped cold turkey then typically it's an update issue all right i'm on the button the website for expressvpn well, well what you should do is is pull up the expressvpn app on your laptop like you wanted to connect that one connect oh, button okay. and then right yeah. at the top of that box it would say if there's an update available okay all right uh, actually, when I click on the icon, it says unable to repair. Please disconnect the VPN and try again. Oh, so you're already connected. Yeah, that's what I meant when I said it was broken. I am getting this message. Oh. But I have not. So you hit the button, disconnect. We're going to lose you probably. And then try reconnecting well if we'll see if there's an update you can reconnect to us without a vpn are you you're you're meeting with us on the same computer because yes so so either you're using the vpn or you're not i'm not sure about the error message you're getting but it sounds like you're connected so you're probably meeting with us through the vpn if you were to disconnect the VPN, I would expect your connection to drop with us, if if only momentarily, uh, but maybe completely, where you'd have to get back into the meet. Okay, I'll try that. Yeah, and Let's just see, see what the results of that is. See if it says that there's an update available. See if it fixes your your error message there. It's a very easy program to re-download and install. So I think the easiest thing to do if it's not working correctly and it doesn't need an update is go to add remove programs and uninstall the app and then reinstall it. Reinstall it. Yeah. And then in from what I remember, I think you'll need to get your encryption key from the website and paste it into the app. And I don't recall how to do that on um, I think it'll walk you right through it during install. If I remember right, it seems like it points you right to where you get your your info. Like, okay. like I don't remember specifically now, but I remember it holding me by the hand to get that information. <laughs> okay, that's good. Yeah, and if you if it if it's any more complicated than that, let me know and I can give you a hand with it. Okay, sounds good. I'll do that. Uh, I'm letting it. Uh shut down now and we'll see about that yeah since it didn't even interrupt our conversation when you shut it down i suspect it's error message is correct it is broken it it looks like you're connected but it's not routing traffic could it be uh, here's one thing that would throw off express vpn if you were connected twice in your computer if you're connected, connected what well, twice, like you were connected through an Ethernet cable and a Wi-Fi connection at the same time. That would confuse ExpressVPN. No, it's strictly Wi-Fi. Yeah, okay. Well, I'm going to leave you to play with that and get back to us either later this yeah, afternoon or by next Talk meeting. Talk yourselves. I'll be fine. <laughs> Anybody else out there got some questions or troubleshooting that we should 
we should uh, address uh, somebody can I'm happy to well, help I'll, with anything I'll comment on ExpressVPN if you're dumb enough like me occasionally I will accidentally run my PC with ExpressVPN that's already connected maybe with the Ethernet running ExpressVPN it continues to work but the performance just isn't quite as great mm. But it's interesting yeah, how it does pretty. continue to work. You'll just see more buffering. And if you get tired of the buffering, you go, oh, I did it again. Now, now, Dave, the problem you're you're describing is when you're running your your Express VPN twice. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, it's running once from the router and I'm connected that, you know, to that router through wireless and then I'm running it on the PC. Yeah, I've I've run into people in their households doing stuff like that. Like yeah. they've they've gone ahead and configured the router, so anything that connects to that Wi-Fi router is using ExpressVPN yeah. by default. But then they also have it running on their laptop, so they've right. got a, an encrypted tunnel inside an encrypted mm -hmm. tunnel, which is more overhead for your internet connection and your equipment. But and it just, does work. It's just lousier yeah yeah exactly that's you're absolutely right it does work it just slows things down it's it's harder on the computer because it doesn't need to be working that hard and it's harder on the router well no actually the router's doing that stuff anyway it's, it's just harder on the computer and it's slower on the com on the data because it's got to go through the encryption decryption phase well but i think the uh Registration is the very first time you load it. I think it requires you to enter the key. So it's quite straightforward. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I remember too. I, I either, you know, it seems like when I do these kinds of things, I either remember specifically it's a challenge or I remember specifically it's not a challenge. And when it's not a challenge, I, I, I rely on them to just to point me in the right direction. In fact, speaking of, of challenges, I have just replaced the wireless controller for our ceiling fan in the living room. Did it this morning. Uh, the uh, we, we have a remote control that's been really iffy. I took it apart, cleaned it. It got better, but the remote is just broken and we've got some silly stuff like like you turn the light on, it's fine. You, you flip on the fan at main power. And then later you turn on the light with the remote control. And if the fan's spinning, this is when the fan's not spinning, it's not an issue. But when the fan's spinning, if you try and turn the light off, it won't turn off. It absolutely, you cannot turn it off with the remote control. You got to go to the wall, hit the power switch, turn off the whole fan. And because of the style fan it is, you got to flip the switch back on just so you have control over the light again. And as the fan is stopped, now you can turn the light on and off, on and off. But as soon as you turn the fan on, you can't turn the light off. So if you turned on the light, you got to go across the room, turn the whole thing off and start again. So I'm like, oh, it's I... probably the lack of a ground wire. Oh, really? Well, we this is a problem that creeped up. It never used to have this problem. Yeah, that still could be the ground wire because a lot of the fans require a ground wire to work properly on their remotes. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's an interesting thought. So uh, as I continue, the the fan, uh, because, because this wasn't a problem, it became a problem. The remote's in bad shape. I decided I would replace it with one of these universal fan controllers. And I did this this morning. A very straightforward uh, replacement. You got to take yeah, you got to get into where the controller is. I actually was just exploring this morning. I, I had Computer Club all set up. And I thought, uh, why don't I just go explore what I'm going to need to do to do this switchover? I was going to surprise Yuya because it's her birthday this this month. And, and so I, I like to get her little surprises throughout the week because I never know what she wants. So I know I'm going to hit something. Correct. <laughs> and so so I, I, I go up and I take the cover off. And what I find is that's the entire fan mount and it. it comes into my hands I'm like oh well that's not just a cover that's holding the whole thing up there but fortunately when it was installed there was enough cable that was installed in it that I could drop it all the way down to the stepladder I was on 
and set it on a stand there. So I like I'm just gonna go ahead and do this because it's right in front of me and connected everything up, put it back up, brand new remote control thing works great. But this is supposed to be a smart interface as well. And so I'm supposed to be able to control it using Smart Life, the, the um, Internet of Things uh, framework that I think Amazon bought it a, a number of years ago. And so this is a very basic Chinese thing. Uh, I, I don't mean that derogatory. You know what I mean. It's just like I didn't pay a lot for it. It's mass produced. And it came with very poor instructions, and I think I've reached the point this morning where I can't get it on a network. It does not broadcast any kind of signal to connect to. It's I, I've gone through the instructions that came with it and got on the internet this morning and started digging through this stuff. Like... No, that's the old one. But it came with very, very poor instructions. And there's nothing about it. You don't see a Bluetooth signal. You don't see a Wi-Fi signal. But all the instructions you find have you dealing with it as though you do. And so it will not connect. I'm going to play around with it. I'm going to contact Amazon customer support and explain the problem I'm having and see if they have a solution for me because it is advertised as a Wi-Fi smart fan where you could basically tell Alexa to to turn on the turn on the fan or turn on the light it, it's supposed to have those capabilities but I can't get connected to it it's been a good hour monkeying around the fan portion works great the remote control and everything and I would think, I mean, unless it's complete fraud, which is the reason I need to talk to Amazon. But it is, says, start your intelligent life ceiling fan remote control kit. Everything about it, uh, as well as the, uh, the write-up on Amazon, all talks about it being a Wi-Fi smart device and talks you through using the applications. But it does not seem to broadcast any signal. So I'll let you know how that results. That's either, I mean, it's got good stars for good reviews for what it is. Everybody understands what it is. It's not a high quality product or, or it's not a high quality bill. It's not, it's not an Apple product. It's, it's, yeah, I, I paid $30 for it. It's, it's totally not an Apple product. <laughs> but who knows, maybe Amazon will send me another one and that one will be fine. Which will be wonderful in my world of not wanting to replace fans, having to do it twice. Or maybe there's some secret I can't figure out. Is anybody using like a smart fan out there? Have you are you are you familiar with the kind of experience? What what what's impressive is, like I was worried about compatibility in the first place. I'm not somebody that installs this kind of stuff. I was worried about compatibility in the first place, and it said universal. I'm like, well, we'll see when it gets here. And it's very straightforward on these fans. There's very specific colored wires. They're well marked on the fan because I guess they know people are installing these themselves. But the device I got was very well marked on it, so it was very easy to connect. And and all of the controls of like how fast this fan goes, whether the light's on or off, that's all inside this unit that I just replaced. So it was very easy to change the remote control uh, with a new unit. I'm just a little disappointed because I wanted to play with it on my smartphone. I found the smart devices in general to be extremely frustrating either difficult to configure or if you change something in your internet type definitions they drop off and you won't find them again and can't redo them um, for example I have two box mini splits one connects to the Wi-Fi line the other one doesn't you know do the exact same thing same unit I can even try either remote that doesn't want to do it um, Waze, once I switched my subnet, 
I've never been able to configure the devices. They've re sent me brand new devices that have never been configured and used. Those won't eat attach either because they tend to, I'm sure, appears they want everything in the domain dot one network rather than something else. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, I, I, you know, and the smart devices, like I've got some plugs, you know. Uh, yeah, yeah, the, the, the middle the, or low end of this market is really just a strange grab bag of odd, poorly supported products that are just out there in the yeah. market for cheap. I've got some smart plugs as well, and I went through a period of time last year where every time there was an update, I would lose all my configurations. There was there was an update to either the the Amazon or the Alexa system, or there was an update to FET, I think was the name brand, F E I T. And every every time I would go in, my profile's completely gone. There's Yeah. Well like I switched my smart plugs on some lights to turn on automatically at dusk and turn off at a fixed hour. Yep. You know, something happened and they no longer would turn off. So then I wound up, okay, I could use the app that comes with it or I could use Alexa and do another definition and that way I could get it to work to turn off. So I have basically two definitions saying turn off and I don't really know which one's totally working now. I had exactly the same experience with my smart plugs. Is I, I set it up in one place and set it up in another place. It never was quite clear which one was working, but it was very clear when they both stopped working. And my basic thing is don't trust them. Don't use them for a security system or you're asking for trouble. <laughs> well, there's some of that passive security system that, 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 I mean, if it's, if it's like your, your Alexas are supposed to, your, oh, I, I, you know, I've said Alexa a dozen times already. And I just realized my smart speaker isn't going off and it's because I was smart enough to hit the mute button on it. So it, 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 it's not supposed to, whether it's listening to me or not, it's not supposed to respond to me. <laughs> Cause that's, that's what a smart speaker mute button really does is it says, don't respond to the voice. It doesn't necessarily say don't record the voice, <laughs> but, but anyway, that's that, that, yeah, that was my experience. I don't know where I was going with that. I have recently had another experience, though. I, I said this fan didn't didn't show a a uh, Bluetooth or a Wi-Fi. It's supposed to be Wi-Fi, so I expect it to behave like a Wi-Fi printer before it's set up. It's broadcasting its own hotspot, and from that hotspot, you're able to connect to the device directly and send it information how to get on the 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 wireless network. For those of you that that aren't familiar with this, this is a very typical, this is a typical scenario for uh, devices that are Wi-Fi enabled that do not support Bluetooth, is that they would, and uh, like an HP printer is a good example of just broadcasting a hotspot that you would connect to, to, to finish the setup, to send it the network settings so that then when it restarts, it connects to your Wi-Fi network. But this thing isn't isn't broadcasting that at all, and and it's neither broadcasting the Bluetooth, and there is a a key combination I found through a series of Google searches where you can hold the remote buttons in a certain way for a certain amount of time, and it's supposed to put it into like a pairing mode, but that doesn't appear to be working either. So I think I think it's just broken. I, I'm gonna contact. I'll let you guys know next week what I discovered, whether there's actually something there or not. Um, oh, I know what I was going to get at, though, is this is reminding me that I've recently, uh, you know, I've switched to an iPhone 11 over the summer. And I, what you probably don't know is I have one of these uh, Elm 327 devices that you can get on Amazon. They're pretty cheap. They're like $15. And they plug into the data port, the ODB2 port on your car. And allows you to interface with your car's computer using your using your smart device. And so we've recently been dealing with some radiator issues with the minivan because that's the car we're driving. And I like to monitor the temperature of that. 
And so before I got the iPhone, I would use my Android phone and I could just keep track of where the engine temperature was in real time. It would also say things like how fast I was driving in the tachometer, what, what the rotations, but all I really cared about was the, was the temperature. And so I, I got the app installed on this iPhone 11. I, we got the car running and I'm gonna pay attention to the temperature. I start up the app and it will not connect to this device, this $15 device. And I'm fighting with it and fighting with it. I, I don't understand why I won't find it. And I start reading the small print on the app. And the app says, it says, if you have an iPhone, you may not be connected to your device because it does, your device does not support Bluetooth Lite version 4.0. And it was at that moment I realized the iPhones have cut off support for these older devices. They actually had a cheeky comment in there like, this isn't our device's problem. This is your iPhone's problem. The, the iPhones, I imagine to save battery life and to perpetuate into the future technology, they are not supporting the Bluetooth below version 4 LE. And so if your device is an older style Bluetooth device, there's a chance that your iPhone won't see it. And in consequently, in, in this desperate attempt to smartenize my fan, I went and grabbed my Android device just to see if I got, I was able to see a Bluetooth signal being broadcast from the sand. Well, that didn't, it, it wasn't having any luck. I did it on the iPhone and on the Android, and I was getting the same results. It wasn't seeing the fan at all. But this is an interesting thing in my world because I want to be able to monitor my car. And so now I'm carrying my old Android device with me so I can use this plug. And the real recommendation is if you want to use your iPhone, you need to buy a new plug adapter. <laughs> one that supports the newer standard of Bluetooth. So that's just a little PSA for you folks out there as far as Bluetooth goes. I guess iPhone, everything in my life that connects to this iPhone, I guess is uh, a higher, higher version of Bluetooth. All my headsets, my watch, uh, all this stuff is, but this $15 data port connector for, it's called ODB2. And it's been on cars since the early 2000s. And it's a standard interface for having access to all those sensors. And your ability to read and interpret that information comes down to how sophisticated a software you want to pay for. But uh, it's all right there. You can turn your 2005 car into a smart car just by adding a port and the right software to be able to monitor this stuff. Of course, apparently, you got to do it with an Android device because iPhones won't do it with this older device. Um, so those are, those are things that I brought, personal experiences. I don't know if anybody else has had that kind of experience, but if you have, you might be using an iPhone with an older Bluetooth connector. And it's just not compatible. If you're looking in the document and you've looked at our, our timer, it says we've got nine minutes left. We could go on to one of these news articles. Or if you guys have a personal experience you'd like to share. Well, I know, uh, I'm still looking, searching for a, uh, a modem, not a modem, but a router that I can use the uh, ExpressVPN in, in San Carlos and like that and um, so I looked at Amazon asked for one that uses Express VPN and um, it a whole uh, array of routers uh, and so I looked at an inexpensive one a Netgear Wi-Fi router okay and um, so it didn't say anything about what VPNs it uses. So I looked at the operation manual for it at the end of the, the article, and it gives instructions for installing open VPN. So which is it, different, yeah, which is different. Uh, and they claim to be wonderful, but they're 
uh, from everything else I've read that the Express VPN is better. Well, and well, it's so, not necessarily better, Paul, but it is easier. And th that's what makes it better is that that they can really help you administer your router when you're having problems with it. Whereas you're you're on your own if you set up OpenVPN on your own on your own particular router, you've got to set all those configurations yourself. It can be done. It's just not as easy, and that's that's what makes okay. Express better. Well, I guess so anyway, also Express VPN has its own proprietary VPN protocol that it uses when it can, and that's supposed to be faster with less overhead. Whenever you get disconnected, you're supposed to be able to get reconnected quicker and so you can't take advantage of that stuff if you don't have express vpn in the router in the router itself yeah. so anyway i i just wonder is this the am i doing the right thing looking at the operations manual looking for where it says express vpn well yeah you're not going to find express vpn in the netgear router they they're they're not going to say anything about that because what you what you would be doing is you'd be flashing you'd be replacing their software with Express VPN software, and that's one of the reasons that Flash Router is kind of a nice way to go, but they charge such a premium, is that they've already taken on that responsibility. They've 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 got the router that you need and they've already put Express VPN in it. Now I can put Express VPN in your router. But the problem is at the exact same level you're at, if something were to go wrong, uh, there's no, there's no um, warranty for that, right? You're, you're literally voiding the warranty with the Netgear by changing the software in it. So if something goes wrong with it, it not only is it a pain in the butt, but you may not be able to... Well, I, and that's not necessarily true because you could buy it from Amazon. You could screw it up. You could send it back and say it just doesn't work. The yeah. I I I I think you could get away with doing that. Yeah, DDWRT or something like that, like uh, or Tomato, adding to your Netgear router is a pain in the neck. And yes, it's t difficult. Their own proprietary software, which they works better, except has some limitations is super easy to install and i wouldn't have very few problems about doing that and so the only thing to check is if there's a router a level of that router and i think you said that uh r7000 there was like a mod 2 mod 3 versions and you have to find that out yeah and i think i think this r um 67 would work but just like dave just said like we talked about last week buying on amazon you don't know whether you're getting a v2 a version 2 or a v3 a version 3 and that is critical in being able to install this software is to be accurate on that and so it's just less of a headache to buy it from flash router because they'll send it to you already set up if they had a problem flashing it well, that's not the one they're sending you. They just eat that one. <laughs> that's right. So, so how much are those routers routinely? Well, you can see right here, this one right here, this is, I, I suspect, a refurbished one for this price. 60, I, yeah, 38% off. I don't know why it's 30, 38% off, and I don't see anything that says refurbished. But this is a $70 router. Well, and. Because I yeah. saw something for two, $250, and I thought, oh, no. Well, that's the thing with Flash Router, is that you could, f those routers are like $250, but they've taken the onus of making a mistake on themselves. So if they've mm -hmm. made a mistake, they just eat that, and they send you one that does work. Why not buy one from eBay, where you could communicate with the seller directly, ask them to look up you know, because printed on the label what the revision is, and if they flashed it to something else, then you'd have the answers in a cheap price. Oh, okay. I'll try that. I just did a quick look and I found them from thirty to fifty bucks. Yeah, on well, eBay. Well, that's the other thing. You could buy a half a dozen of them for the same price as a flash router. <laughs> like, like here's a flash router. This is an R six sixty four hundred. 
that is that should come ready with express vpn and it's 230 it uh it isn't it looks almost identical to the r6700 so r6400 r6, with flash router is $230 and the R6700 is 70 bucks at Amazon. Yeah. They look almost like the almost the identical package, but it could be that they're using a different chipset in one versus the other that doesn't allow doesn't well, allow Express VPN to work on it. This net gear I'm looking at here is a 6080 R6080. And it's reduced in price, 43%. And I thought, well, maybe because this is an old one and and its version is what I need. 30 for $40. Yeah, because really what you need is you need the cheapest one that supports ExpressVPN. Because if you need more than that, you could supplement it with your with your mesh network you've been using a mesh network back home you could decide that's home, the way yeah. to go in san carlos you could but 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 the vp the only way to get the vpn in there is to put it between your internet connection and that home network so you need at the very least the most the the most economical solution of creating that 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 point in that router before your home network oh our call oh, is about to end I think we're on okay. the countdown right this moment. So I'm going to open up the next meeting and I will see you guys over there. Remember, we're using the new meet code. And if you've accepted it on your Google Calendar, then you should be able to jump right into it. And I'm starting it now. That was quick, Paul. Yeah. Apparently, I'm in. Yeah, you're obviously an expert. <laughs> well, so uh, in this regard, I was wondering if that router that Juan put on my system would would be suitable. So I don't know if you can do this to talk to Juan and see what router it was. Well regardless regardless of what router it is i would doubt that it you could put express vpn in it because those routers that he yeah the routers he he distributes are tp links and they typically you're you're not installing you can do things like you can set up open vpn but there's a real yeah. disadvantage to doing that kind of setup with with express vpn because you first need to be more knowledgeable about how to set it up, but then the flexibility of, of changing that, it's, it's very unflexible for changing the setup. Like when you're trying to troubleshoot problems with your VPN, like I can't watch Netflix in the United States from Mexico, yeah. you need the flexibility of being able to move from one connection to another connection like I want to, I want to move my VPN from Dallas to Los Angeles or to Colorado to see if I can get that access. And when you do that in one of the one of these routers that supports Open VPN or or a PPP connection, the uh, you you have to know how to administer that router and you have to know how to go in and change it and put all that information in manually. And I'm not saying you can't do it, you can't learn to do it. I do it for people when I have to. Uh, it's uh, in a uh, in an environment where you control both ends. That's absolutely the way you want to do it. You want to get this company down in Mexico connected to that company in the United States. Both ends are always known. You know exactly what you're doing. So you do put it in stable and static like that. But under our circumstances, where these VPNs are being used as much for security as they are for for uh, TV viewing, the TV viewing at any moment could be affected by where you're connected in the United States. And you want to be able to change that easily just by like a drop down list. And you don't get that if you configure these things manually. Manually, you get to call me and ask me to do it for you again. <laughs> 
So yeah. it's it's not my recommendation. It does give me work, but it's not my recommendation. <laughs> I think I do think your money in the long run is better spent getting the right router that takes the right software. And then you can you can work with uh, ExpressVPN when there's issues and they can look at your router and guide you and you can take full advantage of what they've got as customer support before you need to call somebody like me to come sort out why it's not working. Oh, is ExpressVPN a monthly charge or annual? How does that work? Yeah, well, it seems like, like it's both. You get a D, yeah. you get a discount yeah, if you... When I'm not in Mexico. Well, you, you get a better price if you pay uh, annually. Oh, okay. And so that's something to think about. Also, having a VPN at your disposal yeah. is, is a very handy thing. Any cyber cafe, any random hotel Wi-Fi... You can turn it on and know at the very least you haven't gone into a honey pot. You're not you're not at the motel yeah. six and there's somebody three rooms down collecting people's personal information that you have to worry about because you're encrypted oh, okay. from here through so I wouldn't I wouldn't recommend dealing with uh, a VPN. If you're buying into a VPN, I say go for it. You should you should make it part of your toolkit. Well, we have privacy on, on our uh, protection. Uh, I forget which one it is that, we, that we're using. That my sister-in-law set up for me. Uh, like, a, like a Norton's or a Maca it McAfee's? A Norton's. Huh. It isn't either of those. It's, okay. But it's a big name. <clears throat> but anyway. The more I learn, the less I know. <laughs> <laughs> that is the truth. There's so much to know. <laughs> you didn't. You don't know what you don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Until you try to learn. <laughs> it's when you start knowing what you don't know that it becomes such a large collection of stuff. <laughs> so I'll keep on my yeah. pursuit. Well, we we're talking about subscription services just now with VPNs, but I've got some news here from Netflix. Have you guys been paying attention to the changes that they've just announced in the last two days? There are two things that are happening right now. Netflix has a plan to have a low-tier advertising uh, plan for $6.99. Should start in November. They're gonna. It's gonna start. I think November first in Mexico and in Canada, and then it's gonna be available in about a dozen countries. I think starting on the third. So they're gonna. I think they're giving. Yeah, they're giving like a two day, two day window to try it out in Canada and Mexico to see how. And then they're gonna crank it up in Korea, South Korea, Spain, Germany, Italy, United States. A half a dozen other countries. It's all in this article talking about this ad plan. But apparently for $6.99, you're going to be able to consume Netflix. It's going to... Uh, the constraints on it are that there will be ads at the beginning and during the program. The ads could be anywhere between like 5 to 30 seconds long. If uh, you think this is going to go off the way it has for other, other services where you're waiting for the ads to finally come in, Netflix has already sold all this ad space. So it's immediately going to be enabled and full of ads. So there's, there's no build up to ads. If you choose this discounted rate, you're going to immediately be dealing with ads. Uh, you also, uh, there's a small section of the Netflix catalog that you're not going to have access to. And, and Netflix, in, in the things I read, Netflix says this is a temporary uh, development. It has to do with their licensing agreements with the content. Something about how it needs to be exclusive to the streaming service without ads. And so they're, they're reworking those arrangements. Their goal is to have their entire catalog available to this other tier, this lower tier of Netflix. 
Uh, but right now, as they release this lower tier, there is a small subsection of their catalog that's not available, and it's because of the licensing constraints that are in, in place at the moment. They say even right at this moment, that number will be smaller by the release of this server. Like right now, that they're still in talks, but they expect it to be even a smaller amount that's restricted because they're constantly in these talks trying to work out these new licensing agreements for the ad platform. They also say that this lower tier will only get 720p HD video. Uh, so you won't have access to 1080 or 4K video if you're paying basically seven bucks a month. Uh, what I didn't realize until I read this article was that their $10 basic, wait, basic, yeah, their $10 basic used to never have 720 HD. And so if you were paying their very basic, uh, Netflix before you weren't, you weren't getting any high definition TV to begin with. So this is an update to both their $10 plan and this new plan. It, um, both both these, these tiers will see a higher quality service than their minimum has seen in the past. I said five, I meant 15, 15 seconds to 30 seconds long. And it's basically $3 cheaper than their cheapest plan. You're just gonna be doing ads. Now we know the reason that, that Netflix is doing this is because their subscriptions dropped. The, they knew that they couldn't do perpetual growth. They weren't expecting it to drop so dramatically. Uh, Paul, I'm going to just mute you because I'm hearing myself through your speakers again. The So we, we know the reason they're doing this is they're trying to raise their, their stock price again. And this is a real revenue stream. It's very easy to show um, advertisers uh, how to charge them, how to bring in money. And they're doing it right now because Disney Plus is about to offer the exact same thing. And so they're, they're, they're rolling this out, not quite all baked because they want to be doing it before Disney Plus is doing it. They, they want to grab these lower tier um, potential customers. And I, I say potential customers, and it brings us to the next article that I'll point out to you, another Netflix, is that they um, have just introduced a feature, a feature to migrate your Netflix, your Netflix profile to a new Netflix sign-in. So this is, Grandpa has paid $16 a month for the whole family to have access to Netflix. None of them live at home. And Netflix is going to start cracking down on password sharing. That's what this is all about. They've offered this cheap tier that's available for the kid that's at college. And he can just deal with ads. And here's a very easy way to move his profile off of the family Netflix account over to his own Netflix account. Or the ex-girlfriend or the ex-wife that's still using the same account. This is a very easy, frictionless way to get them into their own account and get off of this account as Netflix plans on really cracking down on password sharing, which everybody's doing. <laughs> so these have got, these two announcements go hand in hand. This is uh, one of these were announced yesterday and the other one was uh, announced today or, or one was announced the day before and one was announced today. Well, well, I have two free Netflix subscriptions. One is through T-Mobile and one is through Cox Communications. I think this is a real, that's a really smart way to do it. You can actually get a free Netflix through your Telmex connection if you've, you may already have it. You may have just ended up on a plan that gives you free Netflix because it's just available. 
if you, if you're if you're buying the the 20 megabits or the the 50 megabits well part of that package is a netflix or a disney plus subscription and so you could take advantage of it like that netflix mexico yes but you know what we've discovered and the person that i rely on for this information is um um who's not with us right now linda linda is doing this Linda has purchased Netflix in Mexico and uses it anywhere in the world, but pays a cheaper rate because they've had cheaper packages here in Mexico. Oh, I see. I think the trick is that you have to have a, a Mexican address and a, a Mexican billing method. So you have to have like a, a bank card associated with a Mexican address to be able to make that purchase in Mexico. But as soon as you have the Netflix account, then you can use it anywhere that Netflix exists. Canada, the United States, England, Germany, you know, anywhere. So that I, I've i actually run across, I, I, I'm not familiar with where it is right now, but I've, I, I think we've even talked about it. I've run across lists that people keep of the cheapest place to buy Netflix so that you can buy it in that country. Maybe you temporarily use a VPN to sign up for it in that country and you're able to use it in any other country. Well, both those links are in this document if you're interested in what Netflix is doing recently. I don't know if advertisements in Netflix is very appealing to me but if they're going to crack down on password sharing, I might have to go get one of those Telmex accounts. I wonder if the Telmex accounts will be um, ad supported or not. It seems like they're single use accounts to begin with. Like you and the kids can use can use those Netflix accounts, but you don't have multiple accounts you can hand out with the uh, Telmex supported Netflix accounts. I did see an article today that enlightened me to the idea of buying internet from Walmart. And this is kind of interesting. I read through the article. It's a very short read. And it's basically a press release from Verizon. But they're, they're working with Straight Talk and providing Wi-Fi devices from Walmart that connect to Verizon's 5G and 4G LTE networks. Now, if you can imagine what this is, is that this is like that mobile hotspot that we used to talk about buying and putting and carrying with us as we travel, the, or using a hotspot on your phone. This is a Wi-Fi router intended to be plugged in in the corner of your house that connects to Verizon and gives you um, Wi-Fi access offers unlimited 5G and 4G LTE data with speeds up to 100 megabits on 5G or 50 megabits on 4G. It's also a Wi-Fi 6 router. So you could go to Walmart now, buy this device, plug it into the corner of your house, and that's your internet connection. That's kind of cool. Uh, you do have to be in a Verizon coverage area to be able to take advantage of it. The equipment is $100. The monthly fee is $45. It's very competitive. Unlimited internet. Might actually have to look, at, look into something like this uh, for the bed and breakfast. At the very least, it seems like a cheap way to supplement internet. I have, with that, with that same theme, I have actually had the uh, opportunity to play with Starlink recently. I don't know if any of you have gotten to actually touch or use a Starlink setup. But uh, my neighbors went ahead and got it because Telmex is so bad. We can't get cable out here. And so their real options are Starlink 
or Juan's Wi-Fi, or a similar device like what, what, what I just showed you, a Telmex or Telcel sells a mobile hotspot that you could use in your house, very similar to what we were just looking at for the United States. Telcel has an internet in a box that you could go buy. So those are really their three, their three options. The internet in a box, oh, that's my name for it, that you could get from Telcel, you go down to the office and buy it. In this area, they only sell you 10 megabits a second up and down. So if you're looking for more internet than that, you're not looking for it through the cell, cell phone company. In fact, Juan is your only option outside of Starlink for getting faster internet on my block. You can go three blocks over and there's fiber optics from Telmex. And so you can get fast speeds like Jim's getting up on his hill. He's getting really fast fiber optic speeds. But on my street, none of that is available. And so it's 10 megabits a second from Telmex, the traditional phone company. 10 megabits a second through the cell phone network, Telcel, or it's Juan with whatever you can get through his Wi-Fi. And that's the reason that I've settled on, settled on Juan. But I got to set up the Starlink system for my neighbor the other day, and it was amazingly straightforward, easy to use. We just stuck it on his roof, ran a cable down under the door, plugged it into the router that comes with the device and followed the app instructions on his wife's phone. It was very easy to do. It was already set up to connect to the network. There, there was no kind of authorization or username or password that was needed because they signed up and bought it online here in Mexico. It, it was a Mexican purchase because they offer service in Mexico. So their whole experience was purchasing from Starlink for Mexico. The thing that threw me off a bit was the equipment they had was a little different than I was expecting. It is a combination of a rectangle shaped dish and a specialized cable that plugs in with a port that looks like a mini HDMI port. And there is no ethernet connection available, which makes it a really odd and cumbersome add-on to a, an existing network that you just want to provide internet to. I've heard recently that there is an adapter that you can purchase, and I'm going to go look for it online. I haven't had a chance to yet, but for like $30, there's like this Y adapter that translates that one port uh, cable to uh, the same port as well as an Ethernet port. So you can plug it into something like your local mesh network. But it was very neat. We put it up on the roof and, and Emily watched it on the roof as the thing just dialed itself in by itself. It, it made all the adjustments for where it would find the, the satellite dish. And when we were done, he had 158 megabytes coming down and 50 megabytes going up. An insanely fast connection for in the middle of the desert with no other options. How long before you get that um, that fiber optic in your area? Ugh, it's like getting my car back. It's just never going to happen. <laughs> Now, they're not installing new fiber in our area. They're only installing it in places where they can make money selling it. And there's just, they haven't, they, they haven't done that infrastructure install around this area. I don't suspect it. But this is interesting. I wouldn't, I've got, we've talked about before, I've got a load balancing router at my house. So I've got Telmex and I've got Juan. I've got room for, I think, I think. Two more connections. I could put two more in th uh, internet connections on this load balancing router. So uh, I might be talking to my neighbors in the future going, hey, how about let me pay for some of that bandwidth? <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> I could run a bridge from here over to them and grab some of that some of that bandwidth and add it to my collection of unstable internet connections. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Well, it seems like a really reasonable way to go. I, I am what what has got me talking about it is we were talking about this internet in a box that's available at Walmart now. The uh, in in the United States, if you can get up to a hundred on five G, that's that's the dream right there. Bring it home, plug it in, five G for your whole house. Or, or I'm sorry, not 5G for your whole house, Wi-Fi for your full house at 100 megabits a second because of 5G. You'd have to be in a 5G area, but that's that's really good. That's, that's uh, amazing speeds. Up to 50 megabits a second if you're in a 4G area. And that's without any installation. Now, the... Sat, the uh, the Starlink is anywhere that you have good view of the sky. You're looking at those kinds of speeds even faster. In comparison for hardware and service prices, the Star Starlink is much more expensive. The Starlink is $500 for the equipment to start with and $100 a month for service. Considering my neighbors are probably going to use it for an old laptop and a couple of cell phones, they might appreciate somebody coming in and helping them pay the monthly fee on it because that seems pretty expensive. But they're it's now fifty dollars. Oh, dropped. oh, oh! Yeah. You're right. You're right. I forgot about that. It just recently dropped, didn't it? No, so that's a much more reasonable price for it. Fifty dollars. No, I did. It seems like last week we did some look into that, didn't we? We saw it dropped even in the Mexican offering. You talking about Starlink? Yeah. Yes, we're talking about Starlink. How do you find out if you're in the 5G area? Hmm. Well, there's coverage maps on online. So you should be able to go find your service provider and see if they've got... 5G. In this case, this this thing that we're talking about is very specifically a deal with Verizon. Yeah. So you would go to Verizon and you'd look at their coverage map for 5G in your area. Yeah, I have Verizon. Okay. Check that out. Yeah, I mean, it seems this equipment is uh, 100 bucks for the box and $45 a month. And if you've got 5G, then you're looking at 100 megabits a second down, which is very impressive speeds. And 40 bucks a month, right? Yeah, 45. 45 bucks a month. That sounds like a deal. Yeah. Compared to what I paid Cox. Yeah, well, and I'm interested in seeing how this works in Alaska because our internet, our internet is um, metered with GCI. It's a metered internet. You pay per tier of how much data you're going to use until you reach $200 a month. And when you reach $200 a month, then it's unlimited internet. And it's very fast, but 100 megabits a second would be fast enough. Even for the bed and breakfast, that would be fast enough. And if it's unlimited, that's awesome. That's a much better price than $200 a month for unlimited access. So this might be a, a reasonable... And we've got Verizon. There's It's been years in the coming, but we've got Verizon available to us right there in our area where the bed and breakfast is. So this might be a, an actual option. Hmm. It's definitely an option in places like Arizona where they've so flat and you've got all this range, all these service providers. I, I think it's it could be an easy competitor to Cox Cable. Cox Cable's metered too, isn't it? The uh, I don't think so. seems like in in Arizona they've got tiered internet where you 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 get charged by how much data you're using. No, they, they charge you by how much bandwidth you have. They charge you by the speed, you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. I would answer that, but I don't know. <laughs> I can make it up. <laughs> well, and I my information might be really old. I just remember our friend JD complaining about how much band, bandwidth he would have to pay for to get. And uh, I haven't really looked into it any time recently. 
Well, if I didn't have to go offline, I could check it right now what bandwidth I have, but I'm paying about, I think, 80 bucks a month, something like that. With Cox. That's why I'm interested in this Walmart. Or even Starlink. <laughs> Well, I'm saying Cox, but is it Comcast I'm thinking? I bet it's Comcast I'm thinking of in Arizona. I have Cox. Yeah. I think with Comcast, you're limited on your telephone line. Um, I, I, had, I, had, I had another service a couple of years ago, and I think it was Comcast and you were limited by the your ability of your telephone line to carry the bandwidth. Well, yeah, since then they've got, they've, uh, oh, great. I wanted to shop internet offers. I need an address in Arizona yeah. <laughs> to check availability. I need Doesn't your mother have an address in Arizona? Yeah. <laughs> yes, she does. <laughs> Give me. You know your mother's get, address. <laughs> no, I don't. I do not. All right. You ready? <laughs> uh, yeah. Give me an address. I don't know if I want to put it over the airwaves. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking too. Hey, you know what you could do though is you could text it to me in our group, and I'll take it off screen. Let's see. No one read it off, please. <laughs> oh, I, can't, I can't figure out how to do it on there. Hang on. Down at the bottom of your yeah, shit, there's chat good. with everyone. All this shows up in the YouTube library. I know that. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> is that true? Yes, it is true. I see the, it every day. The, the video does, and that's why I've taken it off screen, is so that okay. so as long as nobody just rattles off, uh, there is no record of it in video. Dear, dear, it seems as though I have lost you guys. Hang on. <laughs> uh, Ooh, I don't know what's going on over there. Hello, 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 hello. <laughs> There's two Sandys. It was spooky. Sandy logged in again. I'm logged, I'm logged in, in twice. twice. Hang on. Sandy, the three dots at the bottom there. Hit the three dots, in call messaging, type it in there. Uh, but it's not the three dots, is it? Yeah, it is the three dots. What it's, I've pulled oh, up I've got is chat in, with everyone. What I have is in call messages. Is yep, that what that, I want? That's what you want. Yeah. Right, let's see if it works for me. Um, um, just a minute, I forgot it. One, two, five, oh, sorry. Hey, hey, don't rattle it off. Oh, sorry. <laughs> we are live on YouTube right now. No, nobody needs to know your address. Except me at the moment, because apparently I don't know it. No, I can't remember the street name. Well, you know what? You know what? Okay, forget about it. it. Got it. Got it. Oh, okay. Well, I was going to say forget about it because I'm sure I can come up with an Arizona address. Send them an email. Well, I could have that. I've done that earlier, but now I'm all confused. I just see if I got this on, believe it or not. Let's see. 19. Mesa. No, I'm muting you guys. <laughs> well, I have a quick internet question. Sure, do it, Dave. In Firefox, I went to save my profile. And I'm going, okay, it's got bookmarks and add-ons and maybe history. But when I went to save it, it's got 45,000 items. Any idea why it's so huge? Is this the Firefox synchronizing that you're yeah, talking about? The profile. The profile. But you, you don't think that this is also your history and your cookies and all that? Well, I'm just wondering how long they keep history. 
Well, it, think, think of it's, it's got to be a long time. Yeah, I, uh, I have not. I I use the Google Chrome profiles. I suspect it's a similar kind of paradigm. In, in the Google Chrome profiles, they say if you want to eliminate this stuff from your browser, sign out of your profile and then clear your browser. Uh, implying that, or you could infer from that, that they keep a copy on in their cloud. And if you think it's a problem with your browser, then you can wipe all that out and then resync that stuff into your browser. They also say, and this is all Chrome, this is not Firefox. I know you asked about Firefox, but I really don't know with Firefox. I'm it's just assuming. similar. Yeah, I'm assuming the same paradigm. They say if you want to wipe out what's in the cloud, then just r stay logged into your profile and clear your history and all that stuff. And that will synchronize I, I, the blankness, <laughs> the emptiness into the cloud so that all that stuff is gone from the cloud and won't resync down into your drive. I, and I would assume Firefox works the same way. Hmm. Hmm. Xfinity is not available for you guys. Sorry. I thought Xfinity was the internet provider for that area. I guess not. That's really weird. I'm sure that's what you're using for internet. Who are you talking to? You. Oh, well, let me get my um, let me get my information. <laughs> Sorry. Well, it's yeah, we don't have. Well, you know what? Never mind. Never mind, because this is what we were looking for anyway. I just oh, didn't okay. scroll down enough. Fifty bucks a month. What are you having trouble with? Oh, it it doesn't matter. We were trying to get into these this this um, price comparison. Wow, there's a lot of internet available now through Xfinity. Look at that. They're offering two hundred megabits a second, four hundred megabits a second. I had no idea. Are you talking about in Arizona? Yeah. Our area. Well, no, in your area, I don't know. I put your address in, and uh, it said nothing's available. I'm like, that doesn't sound right, because isn't it Comcast you're using for internet down there? Cox. Oh, it is Cox you're using. Okay. Yeah. Well, and I am in the wrong spot altogether. It's all right. I can't even remember what we're using. <laughs> Cox Residential State. And all I'm really trying to do is verify whether whether they have a um, bandwidth caps like we do with GCI. Well, we just increased ours. I don't remember how much. This is um, in GCI? No, Cox. Oh, at Cox. Getting ready to go back to uh, Arizona. Our renter's going to like that. <laughs> he has liked it. All right, I'm looking at Cox plans right now. Yeah, yeah, this is what I'm talking about. Just like GCI, you get one and a half, no, one and a quarter terabytes monthly data. What that means is that they slow you down if you go past that amount of data. You have a cap on how much data you can use. Up to one gigabit downloads, up to 500 megabits a second. So this would be the, these two plans here are price comparable to what we're looking at, that internet in the box with, with um, Walmart that uses the Verizon network. $50 a month is what we're talking about. 
and in these plans you get one and a quarter terabytes and the hundred yeah one and a quarter terabytes of monthly data use so I wonder why these are the same price well regardless it looks like you can get more internet in Arizona with the uh, Walmart offering at the same price the Walmart the Walmart device this uh, what was it called we just had it in front of us straight talk the straight talk device now that's maxed out at 100 megabits a second if you're in a 5g area it's only 50 megabits a second if you're in a 4g area it's still a lot of internet uh, but there is they say it's unlimited so there is no cap of of a terabyte one and a quarter terabytes like there is with cox when you buy it so that seems very competitive at this lower end of the price spectrum if you if you felt like you needed more speed than 100 megabits a second and i don't know what the difference is between these two right here oh oh maybe this is if you buy a year you get twice as much speed same bandwidth cap but twice as much speed so you can just get closer to you this is you know what this is one of those frustrations where they've done this to you they give you more speed and so you can whittle through your bandwidth cap quicker right all of a sudden you're like watching things in 4k because you've got so much speed yeah you're you're able to do more downloads you're and you're just you're not thinking about it and all of a sudden you're using up your internet faster than you were before because you can but you're re you're hitting that 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 cap quicker and it's the same cap but at the same price if you pay for it for a year you get twice as much speed 100 megabits a second is pretty fast though and then if you felt like you needed more speed than that they've got 501 gigabit it still has the same cap on it that one and a quarter and what we know about bandwidth caps and internet providers is if you go over that cap it's either going to slow you down or you're going to pay to to till the next billing period to get more internet available to you so something like this uh this straight talk device might for some people i mean you, you folks my my parents that might actually be a better option for your place in Arizona, given if you're in a 5G location I, and you didn't want to worry about um, running out of internet or paying extra when you did, this might be a, a good solution. Well, guys, we are reaching the end of this meeting. We've been talking for a long time. It's an hour and 40 minutes in. Um, I do have one other topic here, but it is a long read that I have not gotten through yet. But it is, in, it is something about um, uh, Section 230. It's a good review of what that means in the United States. Uh, it, may, it uses very easy-to-follow examples. And it's about a court case that's going on right now, which I don't think they'll win. But if they do win, it would change the way that that Internet is perceived through a service provider versus a, a um, like a Twitter or a Facebook uh, or a Comcast. Uh, Section 230 is what has defined and made it possible for the Internet to grow the way it has. It's an example of regulating technology and dictating how we want technology to be used. And it is it is a long read, but it's very interesting. Uh, I hang it out there. If you are bored looking for something interesting, this is a good read. And we can talk about it next week. But until then, uh, maybe there's some recommendations out there. And I will start out with Army of Thieves on Netflix. If you haven't seen it, we found it very entertaining. 
We had to leave it 15 minutes before it was over because we had a social obligation. So I've got a feeling Yuya and I will sit down tonight and finish the last 15 minutes of it. But uh, very interesting a movie on Netflix that is actually ha is not a zombie movie. <laughs> but lives in Zack Snyder's Army of the Dead zombie movie universe. It's a prequel to that movie. It is not done by Zack Snyder. It is, it is not the Zack Snyder story. But it is in reference to that in the future. And there are some slight hints of stuff in that respect going on but that's not the point of this story this story is a, a stylized bank heist story and we found it really entertaining it was very funny the shots are beautiful the special effects that they use a, a, a lot of the movie is is the dramatization of safe picking and so they've taken and they've built these beautiful cross-sectional uh, designs, three-dimensional graphics of locks falling into place, uh, rotating around the, these conceptual ideas of what's happening when he's spinning the lock and you go deep inside the safe and you watch these amazing special effects. But then it's a very funny story. And there is a, a, a bit of a zombie presence happening in the background that has nothing to do with the movie. At least we've gotten all the way to the 15 minutes before it's over. I suspect that it will end with some zombie thing that ties it to Zack Schneider's movie. I actually wasn't interested in it, in it at all. I, I liked the Zack Snyder movie, but I wasn't interested in a bank heist movie that's had some kind of semblance connected to it. And, and it's been around for about a year now and have not bothered to look at it. And, la and the night before last, Yuya and I were just bored. I'm like, well, let's try this and just started it without even getting a confirmation from her. And we just found it fascinating and enjoy enjoyable. And so that's my recommendation for this week. <laughs> I'm, I'm reading what was the name of that again? Army of Thieves. Army of Thieves, right. Yeah. Go ahead, Cheryl, have, what you got? I have a book to tell you about, but also about the, um, the app that I'm using to read this book. So the book is The Colony, Faith and Blood in a Promised Land by Sally Denton. And it's the story of the Mormons in Mexico and the massacre that happened in Northern Sonora. Hey, um, could you tell me that title again, Cheryl? Yeah, the Colony? The Colony? By Sally Denton. Sorry, go ahead. So I, I didn't mean I, to interrupt you. Took, that's okay. I took it out of my library um, in Canada, and I have three weeks borrowing time where I opened it in this Libby, L-I-B-B-Y. Libby, yeah. And I was just looking at it. I thought, well, I'll tell you guys about it. And I pushed on this button, and it said, the time spent reading is one hour and 14 minutes. As you are 13% through, you're on top to finish this in 8 hours, 28 minutes. Then it says, because you first opened this book one week ago, it might take you another 12 weeks, 4 days to finish it. So <laughs> <laughs> It's sort of like your credit card where it tells you how long if you only pay the minimum. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> how long it's going to take you to finish the book. Which, Cheryl's talking which, about the colony. I, I thought that was kind of interesting that it, it told me all that kind of stuff. But um, the book itself, it's a uh, documentary um, book. It, it tells about the, the, the murder and everything. But it, it also gives oh. lots of history uh, about Mormons. And oh, this is, that, this is the story of that controversial family there in, uh, in Chihuahua, right? Well, there's one half is in Chihuahua and the other half's in uh, Sonora, but yeah, um, yeah. 
Yeah, I remember this going down. When you said the murder, I put it together. This, this is what we're talking about. That would be yeah. a very fascinating read. Yeah. Or I might wait I've for the movie. The prolo <laughs> prologue and uh, the, I mean, chapter one, you know, we're not radicalist cultists. Well, <laughs> that's to be determined. <laughs> so, you know, so it, it's uh, it's an interesting read, and the the fact that Libby gives all this information about me, and I can bookmark things, and I can highlight. For example, it shows that on on October seventeenth, I highlighted a word, and the word that I highlighted was P O S T I T Y. And it was using all these other words about prophet, um, being a prophet, and they were using all these words. And I couldn't understand this word. And then I went back and I read the sentence again, and I read the sentence again. And basically, it's supposed to be posted to social media, and it's spelt wrong. Yeah. <laughs> nothing makes me madder than a book <laughs> that has a spelling error, or you know, they put an extra I in it, and it threw me totally off. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's funny, and that's a published book. I it is. I used to use an app. I still do occasionally, but I haven't done much reading recently. And it called uh, Wattpad, Wap Wattpad. I think that's the right name for it. It, it was a, It is a platform that's popular with self publishing, and so if you fancy uh. yourself an author, then you may have written your own books and stuck them on Wattpad. And one of the things I always got a kick out of is as I was reading, I could find a spelling error. I could flag it in this app and, and the author would get these flags and they go back and, and correct their spelling, <laughs> correct their grammar. <laughs> and it would happen in such real time. It was, it was, it was very entertaining. But P O S I T E D. So they just put I an see. I in there. And it took me so long to figure out what was wrong with that word, you know, because it posted in social media. I thought they did what in social media? They did who? You know. <laughs> so, uh. <laughs> well, that's really interesting. Yeah, uh, that's a story that I would be interested in knowing about. You can take it out of your library. I've got Libby. I've got a library. We got Emily set up with a library card on Libby as well, so she could get books through her devices when we were in Alaska yes. last. I was going to say so, she's them from Alaska. What actual library? Yeah. 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 Mine's from uh, Alberta. So. Oh. Yeah. Well, well, look at that. We've been talking so long. We've gotten the other warning. I think this is a good sign that we should be moving on unless somebody else wanted to recommend something else. Let's bring this meeting to the to a close. Is there anyone yeah, jumping? The I can say is Go we ahead. started watching Frank of Ireland. Frank of Ireland? I haven't heard of that. Is it a show? It's either Frank of Ireland or Frank in Ireland. It's um, little 30-minute shots. Tried it once, thought it was stupid. We, that was a year ago. Well, I think when it first came out. We tried it this time, and we're both enjoying it. It, it, it has some really crazy stuff. So it's a good laugh, laugh kind of show oh, that I'll, fills you know a 30 minute space i'll put it on our list here did you look it up i think it's called frank of ireland i'm gonna look it up right now i can update already about the i spreadsheet oh yeah it seems to be working really well i created the, the spreadsheet in um on my ipad and it is being saved in the iCloud. I then downloaded the app iSpreadsheet on my phone and I opened it up and I'm able to edit it and use it either on my phone or on my iPad. And it's our gambling diary. No. <laughs> so... <laughs> Frank, okay, of Frank of Ireland. Ireland. Yes, there's two, there's two seasons. We're on show three. And I can't, um, it's uh, Amazon. It's um, produced by Amazon, I guess, Amazon Studios. Oh, yeah, that's where you watch it is on Amazon. I see that. Uh -huh. Great. Anyway, it's pretty funny. Those of you who might know, um, 
now I'm now I'm confused. Never mind. I won't say anymore. Ah. <laughs> well, that's two, fine. Because the two main men are real brothers, and they in real life, and they are sons of I think his name is Brian Gleason, but I see here one of the sons is called Brian Gleason. So I'm not sure now, but he's a um, oh he's done a lot of stuff. Uh, the father, you would know him if you saw him. Anyway, he's not in it, but his sons are. Oh, Army of Thieves. Yeah, that looks fun. Yeah, we we enjoyed it quite a bit. Well, and it's so stylized. It's really neat. The colors that they use, the sets they do. I mean, it's... It's... They, it's... They're they're obviously trying to put together some kind of art form. We, we, it's very intentional. The colors, the haircuts, everything is just. It's just one of those things where somebody has meticulously thought of every little thing that's being shown on the screen. Well, guys, I'm gonna say goodbye and call this it. This has been the San Carlos Computer Club, and we will be back next Tuesday at ten. With some luck, I'll be in tequilas. I've not had that kind of luck recently. So when that changes, you will you will be part of it. Uh, if not, I'll be sitting in the same place doing the same thing at the same time next week. And you are welcome to join me. Until next week, everybody. Tech on. <laughs> tech on. Adios. Bye, guys. Bye, Mom. Bye, Nanny. Love you, too. See you later. Bye-bye. That was it. We did our thing. We did it again. That is another meeting all the way through. For me, Scott, at internationalcs.net. If you're looking for computer help out there on the Internet, anywhere, I do remote support. We can talk by phone, chat, instant messenger, email. I'm doing a couple of jobs this afternoon right from this chair because I can't seem to get up. I've got a thousand things each day I do, and I do it all within four inches of each other. So if you are looking for computer help, get a hold of me. And if you have enjoyed the San Carlos Computer Club, please check us out at sccclub.org. The podcast has still on a hiatus just don't feel like I've had enough time to do it justice. Hopefully, I'll bring it back in the future. Uh, right now, I can't even get to an in-person meeting. So, hopefully, that will be something in our near future. But, hey, until next Tuesday, everybody out there, tech on.